So welcome to the 184th monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, everyone. Thank you for coming. Tonight we are going to be hearing from Jason Wright, who will be talking to us about Puppet at Google. I'm sure you're all aware. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate, you know, first things first, Bloomberg for hosting us in this space. Um, it's very generous and is, it's a lovely space. Um, we want to thank you, everyone who's here, for coming and uh, joining us for this. In addition to our space sponsor, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, past and present, IBM, Canonical, the Brand Or Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their continued support. Uh, in addition, Nylog is run by our volunteers, and we would not be able to function without everyone who helps out. Uh, so, you know, continually thanking them at all of these meetings, uh, it's critical. With all that, uh, please welcome Jason Wright with a presentation titled Puppet at Google. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let's find out. Can you hear me? All right, great. So, uh, as you said, my name is Jason Wright, and I'm here to talk to you about Puppet. Uh, hopefully, we all know that Puppet is configuration management software. We've been running it uh, very successfully for Google, at Google for quite a while. Um, I am an SRE in Google's Corporate Engineering SRE team, or CISRE, and I've been with the company for about 11 years. I've done a variety of different things, and I currently own the Puppet service. Um, if I could start off by indulging myself in a little poll, I'm really interested to know who's running some sort of configuration management somewhere. Puppet, Chef, uh, I'll, I'll accept containers. Um. Okay, and how many of you are actually running Puppet? Great. Right. Uh, for those of you who aren't running some sort of configuration management, this is about the only advocacy, advocacy you're going to hear from me tonight. You really should be. I really, really, really personally would not want to go back to the bad old days before we were doing configuration management. All right. So there are some things that I am not here to talk about. Uh, first and foremost, I am not here to talk about Google's proprietary bits. Uh, pu one of the things that I really like about Puppet at Google is that we've been very open about our use of the software, and I'm able to come out and talk about it openly. We do interact with proprietary systems, and uh, I will not be able to describe the proprietary network magic. I'll do the best I can, but uh, what you see is what you get. Um, I'm not here to talk about our release schedules. We use Puppet to release some operating systems, and I'm not going to talk about the, why this, we picked the schedules we did. I'm not even going to really discuss what the schedules are. I'm not here to tell you how to write your Puppet code. Um, it turns out that the upstream documentation that Puppet Labs provides is very good. They have a style guide. They have a lot of, uh, a lot of tutorials on the language. They have type references. They have a lot of excellent upstream documentation. We used to maintain our own style guide internally at Google, for example. Now we just use the upstream Puppet Labs stuff. Um, I'm not going to describe how we monitor the service. I personally think that it's boring. Uh, if you want to know how we monitor our Puppet servers for health, you can ask me in the Q&A session, and I'll talk about it a little bit. Uh, we have the capability to assert things about the state of our fleet of machines, such as whether or not a particular uh, patch has been applied. Uh, we do not do that the Puppet way. That's a proprietary Google network bit, and I'm not going to talk about how we do it. Um, so compliance and auditing are out. And as I, as I mentioned, I'm not here to talk about, to be an advocate for Puppet. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you to run Puppet. Uh, I think that it's an excellent piece of software. Google uses it very successfully, but that doesn't mean that it's the right piece of software for your environment. The only advocacy you're going to get from me up here is that you should be running configuration management, not that you should be running Puppet specifically. So I'd like to start off with a little bit of background. Um, Puppet is offered at Google as an infrastructure service. That means that it's owned by a site reliability engineering team, my team, and it has a couple of service owners, me and another guy. Um, I, Puppet is not my full-time job. It's somewhere between 50 and 75% depending on the quarter. My secondary service owner, I get maybe a quarter to a half of his time, and on average I say that Puppet is staffed by about 0.75 of an engineer, not, not, not staffed full-time. One of the features of an infrastructure service at Google as a general rule is that the team running the service does not own the data the service provides. So for our DNS servers, that, which we run, uh, we don't own the, the actual DNS data. We just provide the mechanism for DNS queries to succeed. Puppet is the same way. We don't own the Puppet manifest. We own maybe, by file count, maybe 5% of the files in, uh, in, our, in our Puppet directory and source control which has caused problems for me. Uh, one of my major projects last year was to forklift the Puppet directory from one location in source control to another, and what should have been a simple operation ended up taking about two weeks because I didn't actually own any of the files. 
Um, we have two major kinds of customers. Uh, I, 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 the word I keep wanting to use is class, but they're not different classes of customers. We have two different kinds of customers. Our major customers are the operating system teams. They use Puppet to provide complete operating systems. For the purposes of this talk, I will refer to these operating systems as the core operating systems. This is my term. It, you won't hear anybody else who will be using it. I just need some way for the purpose of this talk to describe the product that these teams put out because our other set of customers who are server owners use Puppet run and to deploy services running on top of one of these core operating systems. So I just need a term to differentiate the core operating system from the service running on top of it. Both teams are obviously using Puppet. The core operating system teams generally are self-supporting as far as Puppet goes and only need help when something goes wrong or when they're trying to roll out a new feature. Uh, in fact, the, the, the teams generally have individuals on them who know the Puppet language a lot better than I do. Uh, I don't write, much puppet, write many Puppet manifests anymore. The add-on module owners or the uh, server owners, on the other hand, um, they, they require the full range of Puppet support, including help writing their modules, and my team does provide that to some degree. Uh, my PR department really likes me to mention that Google does not manage any of our public-facing infrastructure with Puppet. Your favorite service, the search, Gmail, um, social, does not or is not provisioned using Puppet, and they really like me to mention that. We use Puppet to manage our internal desktops, laptops, and servers, and our, the fleet of our Puppet clients is almost, well, more than half laptops, and I'll talk about that later. A little bit more. Um, most of the machines that we manage with Puppet are physical, tend to be physical hardware, either laptops or desktops. So we have been running Puppet for a long time. Uh, we use only open source Puppet and only open source Factor. We don't use Puppet Enterprise. We don't use any of the other software that Puppet Labs puts out. So they put out, you know, Puppet DB, uh, Puppet Dashboard, you know, M Collective. We don't use that stuff. Um, where we have needed our own solution to this, we have generally developed our own, and it is generally a proprietary Google network bit. Um, we have been running, or rather, yeah. We run Puppet uh, under Apache using Mod Passenger as a Ruby on Rails application. It is a standard high performance way to run Puppet, and I'm not gonna describe it because the upstream documentation provided by Puppet Labs is very good. So we have been running Puppet for about eight years. I had a little bit of trouble um, figuring out exactly when we first turned it on, but approximately eight years. As I said, uh, I've been around with the company for 11 years, and I've been involved with Puppet in one way or another for about five. Um, we were originally a CF Engine 2 shop. Well, originally we didn't have any configuration management at all. And then we brought in CF Engine 2 to manage our uh, Linux systems. And then, uh, that worked out relatively well. So we wanted to get centralized management for our Macs. We had absolutely nothing. So our Mac Ops, uh, the, you know, by, and by Mac Ops, I mean the two guys who were providing best effort support for an entire fleet of unmanaged Macs. <laughs> our Mac Ops did a software evaluation about eight years ago. And they found out that basically at that time, the only thing that can manage Macs with any reasonable chance of success was Puppet. So that's how Puppet got in the door. And then, I don't know, a couple, a couple of years after that, maybe two, two or three years after that, uh, our Ubuntu Linux distribution that we use internally, Gubuntu, uh, went through the, the uh, Dapper to Hardy transition, which, as you may remember, was the i386 to AMD64 transition. Now, I know I'm talking to a Linux users group, and I know that we all know that you can manage that transition without reinstalling your machines if you really want to. We made everybody reinstall their machines. So since we were doing a destructive reinstall anyways, uh, and this was before I got involved, we made the decision to switch configuration management platforms so that we were running a single configuration management platform between the two operating systems. Um, one of the features of our Puppet code base is that basically everything is developed in-house because we got started so early. Uh, for, we don't use any modules out of the Puppet Forge. For those of you who don't know, the Puppet Forge is a central collection of Puppet modules. It's run by Puppet Labs, and it has all kinds of excellent software in it that we do not use. Um, we just this year, um, maybe a couple of months ago, added, finally added the ability to run Forge modules. We call them third-party modules. And we have one team that finally checked one of them in. I don't think they're managing any production systems with it yet. 
And uh, the last thing I want to mention on this slide is we're running Puppet 342 because that's what's shipping with Ubuntu Trusty, and that's what we're running on. Uh, so I'd like to start off, uh, since I figured that there would be people who are here who have never seen Puppet code, with a quick example. Uh, Puppet source files are known as manifests, and when you gather all the manifests and supporting files together for a single purpose, that's generally called a module. A Puppet module has to have at least one class. Puppet classes are kind of like classes in, uh, in real programming languages, but they don't have some features that you might want. Um, Classes are generally single purpose, so a single class might contain all the configuration required to deploy a single application. Um, I'm going to set up a simple module in this class with a single class that manages the SSHD, or the SSH daemon rather. So one of the key features about Puppet, as opposed to say writing a set of shell scripts to configure your machines, is that you don't specify the list of steps required to get to your desired end state. With Puppet, you specify the desired end state, and then you sit back and you watch it figure out what steps need to be taken to bring the system in alignment with that end state. The way you do that in Puppet is by configuring resources. Resource is a technical term. A resource is a thing that you manage with Puppet. Everything is resources. Uh, there are a number of core resources that ship with the software, and you can define your own. So I'm going to start my SSHD class with a single resource, the OpenSSH server package. And the way you set the desired state on a resource is to set its attributes. So my desired attribute, my desired end state for the OpenSSH server package is that it's installed. Uh, insurability is a very important concept in Puppet. Most of the core resource types are insurable, and what that means is that after this resource is applied, Puppet is willing to guarantee you that the system is in the state that you desire. Not all of the core resources are insurable. In particular, the exec resource, which allows you to run an arbitrary script, is not insurable. Puppet doesn't come with a universe simulator, so it doesn't know what an arbitrary script is going to do. Um, Let's see. So this sort of classic Puppet example is exactly what we're going to do here. There's a package that installs a daemon, and the daemon has a configuration file. And uh, that's what we're going to do here. We've got the package. Uh, it's worth mentioning that the directory structure you see up there is uh, deprecated. It is the deprecated global directory structure, but uh, where everything is sitting under varder, which is the root of the Puppet Master's directory. Uh, slash modules, and then the remainder of the directory structure is the Puppet autoloader format. You have a directory per module. Each directory must at minimum have a manifest directory, which has to contain an init.pp, and the init.pp has to have a class named after the directory you're in. You set, set it up like that, and Puppet will automatically figure out where all your code is, will automatically, auto, will automatically load it. So now I've added a resource for the SSH service. You see it's also insurable. We, in this case, we ensure that it is running. Puppet is not a babysitter. All Puppet is going to do is use the operating system tools to determine if the process is in the process table. On a Debian-like system, it'll run etsy init.d ssh status, and that's it. You could, if you wanted to try and use Puppet like a real babysitter, you could probably write a health check with a custom check script. But then if you did that, I think you were going to find that Puppet is too heavy to run often enough to run a regular health check on. There are a couple more attributes on the service. Enable true, that is Puppet for make sure this service starts on boot. And it will, uh, like on a Debian-like system, it'll modify the system 5 init scripts appropriately to do this. Or it'll tweak, on, a Deb on, an, on an Ubuntu system, it'll tweak the upstart configuration, whatever it needs to do. It's a no-op in this case, I guess, as HGM and starts by default on the systems that, we, that we're running. So, and the require attribute here is a very important one. It sets up an explicit dependency between the packages. It says, this service resource requires this package resource. And the reason why you have to do that is because when Puppet goes to determine what order it's going to apply resources in, it solves a graphing problem. And for any Puppet, set of Puppet manifests that are large enough to do real work, the solution to that graph is not going to be unique. So on back-to-back -back Puppet runs, resources may run, it may apply in different orders. And Puppet will try and figure out some explicit dependencies. I kind of wish that this is one of them, but this is not an implicit dependency. You obviously have to have the package installed before you can fire up the service. And finally, we add the file resource for the configuration file. I probably should have this require the package too so that the configuration file um, is installed after the package is installed so the package doesn't overwrite it. Puppet would come back and fix this on the next run, but I should probably have that in there. I'm, I'm kind of used to uh, our Puppet environment where we automatically don't clobber conf files. 
Um, you see in this case that we ensure that it is a file as opposed to, say, a directory. And we set some content. Uh, we set the content by calling the template function, functions, or Puppet supports server-side functions. Templ template is one of the ones that ships with the service. Uh, and it uses the ERB configuration language, which comes with Ruby. It does variable substitution. So um, you can see the uh, a snippet of the uh, template at the bottom, that uh, ERB magic there, the stuff between the less than and the greater than, would be automatically replaced by the value of the port parameter, which you can see in blue at the top. Puppet classes are resources like everything else. They can have attributes. When you add an attribute to a puppet class, you call it, it's called a parameter. The word pr parameter and attribute are kind of interchangeable. Um, and when you have a class that takes a parameter like this, it's called a parameterized class, and you can call it kind of like a function. I'll show you an example. So now the question is, we've got our module defined. How do we actually go about applying it to nodes? So the default way, the, the, the way that Puppet comes with, is to use a main manifest and to configure your nodes. All Puppet clients are called nodes in your main manifest. So first I'd like to define what the main manifest is. When a Puppet client contacts a Puppet server, one of the first, to do a configuration run, one of the first things that it does is it runs Factor and it gathers up its local facts and it ships those off to the Puppet server and asks for its catalog to be compiled. The Puppet server will compile all the manifests, do all the variable substitution as needed, and will ship back a gigantic YAML file. I think it's still YAML, it might be JSON now, but it will ship back a giant text file in any case to the uh, node and the file can be truly gigantic. If you have templatized files, the entire content of the templatized file winds up in the, winds up in the catalog. The client or the node receives the catalog and then locally it determines what steps it needs to take to bring the system in line with the catalog. So in this catalog, I define one node, or sorry, in this main manifest rather, I define one node. It is the default node, which is a special node, and it does the obvious thing. Any node that, con that connects to this Puppet Master will be configured to run SSHD on port 22. And again, it's worth mentioning that this directory structure, varder slash manifest slash site.pp, is a global main manifest that is deprecated in Puppet 3.7.0, but it's the way it works now, and it's the way we're using it. So continuing with the example, I've added a couple of nodes test1 and test2.example.com, they both inherit the default node. So Puppet nodes support inheritance, which again is deprecated in Puppet 3.7.0, but it's the way it works now and it's the way we're using it. Um, test1 includes a second Puppet class, a DNS server class, which we can assume sets up a DNS server. Um, it's important to note that node inheritance is always additive. You cannot remove the SSHD class from a node that inherits default. You would have to have a node, you'd have to not inherit default, um, which you could do just by saying node test1.example.com include DNS server. You don't have to inherit. And then test2 is the parameterized class example. You can see that it, call, that it instantiates the SSHD class uh, in the uh, syntax of a puppet resource, and it sets an attribute or parameter to run SSHD on a non-standard port. So it should be immediately obvious that sites.pp is very limited. It's very good for setting your global defaults, and that's really what it's intended for. It is not so good if your nodes don't have stable certificate names, and I'm sorry, I forgot on the previous slide. Let me go back. Test1 and test2.example.com in this slide are not the node, in, in this context, are not the node fully qualified domain names, although that's what they are. In this context, those are the puppet certificate names. Every Puppet node, when it first starts up, contacts a Puppet Certificate Authority server and gets an SSL certificate that will be used for authentication. By default, the certificate name is the node's FQDN. At Google, we do not use FQDNs for our node cert names. We use random UUIDs. And the reason why we do that is because we were originally managing laptops that did not have stable FQDNs, so we couldn't use it. So, all right. So, back to the limitations of site.pp. Uh, I have a little toy puppet installation at home that has about 10 nodes that I use to manage my personal computers, and sites.pp works great for that. But if you have a lot of nodes that you need to apply additional classes to, or if you don't have stable uh, F certain named FQDN mappings, it's really difficult to do everything in site.pp. So the solution is to use what's called an external node classifier, or an ENC. ENC is an external script that's launched, that runs on the puppet server, 
It launched by the Puppet Master every single time a node makes a catalog request, and it's launched with one argument, the certificate name of the node to be classified. Everything else that it needs to know about the node, it determines from the facts that the node shipped. And it outputs a YAML document to standard out, listing the configuration to be applied to the node in question. So here's an example of an ENC. You can see that the ENC script is just an executable. You can call it by hand, and it outputs something to standard out. This is a true Google example. The certificate name is a random UUID. And um, you can see that it adds two classes. The ENC, just like, site, just like node inheritance and site.pp, is always additive. You cannot subtract uh, classes or parameters with the ENC. Two classes, DNS server and the SSHD class and the SSHD daemon will be running on a non-standard port in this example. Uh, the primary use case for the external node classifier at Google is so that server owners can map puppet classes onto their servers by the FQDN, and I'll talk about a little bit about how they do that. Uh, and in, one interesting thing is uh, since we use the fact caches for, or since the ENC uses the fact caches for everything, you either need to do something to share facts globally between all your puppet masters, such as puppet DB, or you need to make sure the facts are always on disk when, at the time the catalog is compiled. We go the latter way. We share no state between any of our puppet backends. So the way that we ensure that the fact cache is always on disk when we need it is we do it with the load balancers. We kind of cheat. So rather than use the default affinity on our load balancers of source port, source IP, we just use source IP affinity so that assuming everything is working right, all the puppet backends are up, a given puppet node will always talk to the same puppet backend based on the, based on the node's source IP. So let's talk a little bit about add-on modules. As I said, the, um, primary, the primary function of add-on modules, although not the only one, is to deploy server services running on top of one of the core operating systems, almost always Kubuntu. We administratively restrict one service per add-on module, so you wouldn't have a single add-on module that configures both DHCP and DNS, although we would let the DNS team have more than one add-on module if they had multiple things they needed to do. The owners, again, are the owners of the individual servers that these modules are running on. And my team's involvement is the running of the ENC service. This is the service that maps fully qualified domain names to Puppet uh, configuration. We do this by interfacing with the Google machine database. This is a proprietary Google bit. Um, but inside the machine database, we have the concept of a server. And associated with the server, we have the concept of the server type. And we provide a way to map puppet classes and global parameters onto the server types. This mapping, we do not support parameterized classes in the ENC, even though the example I gave you in the previous slide was a parameterized class example. We support only global parameters. And all this stuff winds up in a, basically in a big YAML file. And that big YAML file, without getting into the architecture, is served, out of, served by HTTPS out of a cache. And the cache lifetime is sufficiently long that it occasionally causes us problems. Uh, we will get, uh, say, an add-on module owner saying, hey, I just checked in some new, uh, some new mappings for my servers. And when I go and I check the mapping file from my workstation, I see the map there. But when I go and I pop it against the production server, my classes are not applied. What's wrong? You go look on the production server, and you see that its version of the cache, the cache YAML mapping file is out of date. We're going to rewrite this ENC service, but um, it's not far enough along to really talk about meaningfully. So just for now, we're living with it the way it is. So this is a good time to stop and, or take a little break and talk about the uh, first, pro first puppet problem that I'm going to discuss. And this is a case where we shot ourselves in the foot, or really, I shot us in the foot. <clears throat> so our operating system releases, we, we were releasing them this way before we used Puppet. Our core operating systems have unstable and testing, testing and stable branches maintained by the operating system teams, and add-on modules also have unstable testing and stable branches. The core operating systems tend to have some sort of a head directory in front of unstable. The add-on module's head is the unstable branch. So the key feature or misfeature here is that our add-on module track is tied to the core operating system track. If you want to run the unstable version of your add-on module, you have to run the unstable version of the core operating system if you're talking to the production servers. And I can guarantee you that the operating system team doesn't want you running unstable. They reserve the right to break unstable. This worked really well when, we, when 
I was in Ubuntu team and we were initially deploying Puppet and we were also, so we were also, we were the customers and the server owners. Uh, I'll talk a little bit in uh, the next slide about uh, why we got into this situation. Our solution, and it is not a complete solution, are so-called ad hoc Puppet Masters. The ad hoc Puppet Master script starts a Puppet Master running on a developer's workstation. It runs out of their source control client and uh, it runs under, using their credentials at the points where it needs to interface with the proprietary Google Magic. This is great in the sense that you can edit the configuration file, you can remap your environments to do whatever you want, uh, you can test with code that you haven't checked in yet, pretty nice, but it's not so good because you're not actually running on the, on the production servers. You're running under a different set of credentials, you're running on a different machine. So it's not a complete solution. So uh, by, way, by way of explanation for this, I'd like to talk about how we use environments at Google. So much like when you, gather a, when you gather all your puppet manifests together into modules, you then in turn gather your puppet modules together into environments. Environments are discrete sets of puppet modules combined with a main manifest. So um, the examples I give there should give you an idea how we use them. Ubuntu Precise Stable, GMAX Stable. Uh, we generally break our environments up by ID, code name, and track, where ID is sort of the operating system ID. And then the Ubuntu guys like to stick the release that they're using in there, Precise, Trusty, Hardy, whatever. Uh, the MacOps guys uh, decided that they no longer needed to include the code name, so it's just uh, ID and track. And we used to also include the role, ID, code name, role, track, so Ubuntu Precise Desktop Stable. We used to have a lot more environments than we do now. And on top of that, we used to have some really ambitious plans where we thought that we were going to be running hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of environments. And every one of these environments has to be specified in the Puppet Master's configuration file. And I looked at that, and I looked at multiplying it by three, all the number of moments we had by three for the add-on module tracks, and I said, I'll fix it later. I'm going to tie the add-on module track to the core operating system track. That was five years ago. It never got fixed. <laughs> the moral of the story, I remember very vividly, every, every detail of the room I was in when I made this decision. Be very, very careful about the snap decisions you make when you're designing your service. You could still be uh, supporting it five years later. We do have a solution for this now, finally, in Standalone Puppet, and I'll talk about Standalone Puppet at the end. So how many Puppet nodes does Google have? I can't tell you. But I can tell you if you do the math, uh, or rather, I can tell you that we have lots of Macs, primarily laptops, overwhelmingly laptops. We have lots of Ubuntu machines, uh, all Ubuntu. Uh, they are primarily, although not overwhelmingly, desktops. Uh, we have a fair amount of servers, more servers than laptops, but the number of servers that we have is really a drop in the bucket compared to Google, Google's global machine count. And like I said, those servers are always providing internal services. They don't provide any external services. We have a smattering of other operating systems. Uh, I don't think we've publicly disclosed what they actually are, so I'm not going to disclose them here. Uh, we have tens of puppet, we, we, we segment our puppet servers by role. We segment the certificate authority function out onto a separate set of servers than what we call the configuration servers. Under normal operation, a puppet node will talk to the CA only once when it's installed, and then for the rest of the time, it will talk only to the configuration servers presenting the certificate uh, created by the, or set, given to it by the CA. We have less than 100 puppet config servers. Can't tell you the exact number. We have a very small number of Puppet CA servers, less than 10. We've and we deploy our configuration servers globally in five VIPs, and we use Anycast, which I'll talk a little bit more later, to uh, find the closest server. Scaling is a lot of fun. Uh, when I first started at Google 11 years ago, we were still deploying single individual servers to cover roles, uh, at least in, 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 in my team. Uh, in, in the team that became CISRE. Uh, as we all know, single, single servers are the most, sing, most basic single points of failure. Absolutely anything can go wrong. And then depending on how you, you've configured your clients to talk to them, you either need to touch all the clients and change their configuration, or you need to change DNS to fix it. That takes time. We don't deploy a single cluster for the same reason. Having a single load balance cluster in, an, in one site is a little bit better than having a single machine, but still almost anything can go wrong and you still have to reconfigure something if, if it breaks and you need to fix it. So we deploy redundant clusters and we like all of our clusters to be serving all the time. So we like to make sure that uh, clients are sent to the nearest serving cluster. 
And one of the benefits about Anycast is that we get a unified client configuration. All of our Puppet nodes globally use the same Puppet server and are automatically directed to the closest one. The load balancing. How do you know if you have enough capacity? In a couple of slides, I'll tell you uh, how we do it for Google. How many backends do you need to handle that load? What happens if half of them are out? What happens if, say, you've got two data centers and you have planned maintenance in one so it's offline and then somebody backhoes the other one? You're doomed. So you need to make sure that you take uh, disasters and load spikes and everything else into account when you do your, uh, when you, when you do your capacity planning. And then you have the problem of sending clients to the right cluster. You can do it in client configuration, although if it breaks, you have to change the client configuration. And if you're, say, shipping what Puppet server you're talking to using Puppet, and that Puppet server is down, you may not be able to, ch to touch every client using Puppet. You may have to do something else. Um, so I don't recommend doing that. You can use a DNS round robin, which is great. It's really, you know, really cheap, simple uh, global load balancing. But if you have n clusters in your round robin and one of them goes down, one out of n of your requests will fail until you update DNS. And like I said, I don't know about, how, about your networks, but on my network, DNS changes take time to converge. And you're going to be failing requests while that's converging. You can use DNS views. You can return a cluster based on the source IP address of your node. And uh, that works pretty well. Uh, you can manually control where things are going. But if one of your clusters goes down, all of the views that are talking to that cluster will be broken until you fix it. And at Google, um, none of these DNS changes would be made automatically. First of all, somebody who's on call would have to get paged. And assuming that that's caught by automated monitoring, that would take some period of time during which the service is down. Then the on-call person has to find the documentation. Then they have to figure out what to do. Then they have to make the change. Then they have to wait for the change to propagate. It all takes time. It's, it would be really nice if there was some way for the network to be self-healing. And we do that with Anycast. And again, it's a single portable IP address that's routed to the nearest cluster. One thing that we do for, in CISRE for some of our services, but not for Puppet, is to use DNS views plus Anycast. And in this configuration, we return the Anycast IP address for most views under the normal circumstance, but we have the ability to send problem sites or problem views to uh, individual clusters. Again, not for Puppet, but we do that for some of our other services. Okay, so Anycast. Anycast is a coarse-grained load balancing scheme that's based on the network. You take an IP address, and uh, at every site where you have load balancers providing the service that you want to, to route with Anycast, you announce that portable IP address, assuming that the VIP is up and serving, you announce that portable IP address into the network using BGP. So our load balancers talk BGP to our core routers, advertise routes for our Anycast services, including Puppet, and then the network automatically routes to the closest serving cluster. It is important to note that this is the network's idea of the closest serving cluster. The network, Anycast doesn't know anything about the actual load on your back ends, and it cannot make routing decisions based on that. And more importantly for my team, since we do not run the network, we have basically ceded control of where our, where our, puppet tra where our Anycast traffic goes, it, whatever the network does. Um, and networks are imperfect things. Uh, they can physically break. They can uh, logically break. They can break because somebody configured them wrong. Even the load balancers can have bugs, even though my team owns the load balancers. <coughs> Wouldn't know anything about that. So the upshot of this is that all of your clients could be sent to one cluster. So all of your global traffic could be automatically routed to a single site. Are you ready for that? Can a single cluster handle all that load? Because if not, everything's going to fall over in an automated fashion. <laughs> okay, so now I'd like to move on and uh, present some more of the uh, problems that we've been having with Puppet. Um, this one, so the, the, the first one I presented was one where we shot ourselves in the foot. This one I personally think is a bug upstream. Uh, they do not agree with me. This is expected behavior upstream. So we have not been able to support facts, custom facts and add-on modules. Puppet allows any Puppet module that you create to contain custom facts. And it will automatically provision those facts using something called plug-in sync. It's very nice. Um, the problem is that facts are always executed. So for a given environment, if you have two classes, A and B, 
and class B provides a custom fact, and you have a node that consumes only class A. Every time class A runs Puppet, it will still execute B's custom fact. Facts are always executed within a given module path. So if we had allowed add-on module owners to include custom facts, we would have allowed them to run code across the Puppet fleet, not as root, I think as user Puppet, so it wouldn't have been too bad, but it wouldn't have been good. So we use source control to block fact submission in add-on modules. Um, we finally, in Q2 of this year, with factor 1.7, uh, got was able to provide a solution for this. Factor 1.7 includes support for something called external facts, which are facts that are not provisioned using the, the plug and sync mechanism. They don't have to be in Ruby. They can be in whatever language. They just sit in a directory somewhere. I think it's a directory in Etsy and uh, Factor automatically executes them. We did not get Factor 1.7 until something like a year after Puppet Labs released it. It was fine, you know, Q2 of this year, we were finally able to uh, offer a solution for this. We uh, live without uh, custom facts in add-on modules for something like four or four and a half years. Another major problem that we've had with Puppet is that by the, once you start actually trying to manage a large project, such as an entire operating system with it, it becomes like any other software project. You've got developers stepping on each other. Um, one of the things that we did that made this worse was initially we had all of the core operating systems, there were three at the time, Mac OS, Ubuntu, and Solaris. Um, sharing a single common head. We were going to try and share our puppet code between the, different, between the different operating systems and save code and time and everything that way. It did not work out. Um, we wound up, there were enough d differences between the three operating systems that we wound up with a lot of spaghetti code in our puppet manifest. My favorite example is actually the SSHD uh, conf template, which wound up with more lines of ERB templating syntax in it than it did if SSHD configuration and comments. So if you know how long that file is, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so about three years ago, maybe a little bit longer, maybe three and a half years ago, the core operating system teams broke up with each other and they all have their own individual head directories that they check into now and they stripped out all the code from the other uh, distributions and they're all much happier. It turns out that the code sharing works very well for different roles within the same operating system. So for example, a Ubuntu server shares a lot of puppet code with a Ubuntu desktop, shares a lot of code with a Ubuntu laptop. That works pretty well. But code sharing a lot of code between two completely different operating systems we found did not work particularly well. Another way that we kind of shot ourselves in the foot was with class inheritance. Puppet classes support limited forms of inheritance. It's just enough to shoot yourself. Um, and what we did decided the way that we were going to support our add-on modules overriding files that were provided by the core operating system was that they would inherit the appropriate core class and they would take the resource they needed and override the attributes they needed. And that works until somebody in the core operating system comes along and makes an incompatible change and breaks your, mo and breaks your module. For years, for a couple years, two or three years, that was the way that it ran. And if you were an add-on module owner, you would find out when your Puppet run started failing. We now test all of our code with uh, RSpec Puppet. And uh, so now the Ubuntu team can tell when they've broken your add-on module, and they can at least notify you. And also the add-on modules are generally individually tested with, Puppet, with RSpec Puppet. So um, it's, it works out much better. And then the last thing I want to stay on this slide is that up until Puppet 2.7.0, Puppet supported something called dynamic variable lookups. So what that would be, what that means is that you could reference a variable in another Puppet class just by the raw variable. So in this case, in this example, dollar sign variable, and Puppet would automatically figure out which class that needed that came from and would substitute it in for you, rather than using the fully qualified format, which you see there on the left. They deprecated that in Puppet 2.7. Uh, and they removed it in Puppet 3.0, and I'm very glad that they did, because if you have two classes providing the variable, it's kind of a crapshoot which one you're going to get. And the final problem that I want to discuss is the problem of capacity. If you do the math, lots plus lots plus lots is a thundering herd of Puppet nodes. What happens if they all try and run Puppet at the same time? Well, I can tell you exactly what would happen in Google's environment. Our puppet, our puppet servers would melt down because we are not provisioned to handle that. 
We're not even provisioned to handle the uh, puppet default fre run frequency. Puppet by default runs, as, runs the agent as a daemon, and the daemon will contact the puppet servers every half hour. We turn off the daemon, and we run puppet as a cron job. We run it twice a day. We have two six-hour update windows, and by and large, the nodes sleep a random time within that window, run Puppet. Two Puppet runs a day is not very much, especially when you're sitting on a security fix that you need to push out or a major bug fix. So we've been asked to look into, uh, say, running Puppet every hour or even every five minutes. I think five minutes is very ambitious, but we, we're definitely going to start running it more often. So how many Puppet backends do you need? At Google, we find that the Puppet config server, remember, under normal operation, your Puppet nodes are just talking to the config servers because they already have their, their, their certificate. We find the Puppet config servers are constrained by the catalog compile. Um, this takes seconds, tens of seconds, depends, depending on how big your catalogs are, and will tie up a CPU core for that time. Uh, there's some additional load on a Puppet config server, such as the file server functionality. We find that it pales in comparison to... Uh, to, the, to uh, the catalog compile time. So the CPU count, the number of CPUs to handle the load, is the global, catalog request, global average catalog request rate, R, which is in catalog request per second, times the global average catalog compile time, which is in CPU seconds per request, times at Google a linear scaling factor based on the SLA of our virtualization platform. I cannot reveal the real number for N. And that gives you the number of CPUs that we use to run Puppet. So to plug in some quote unquote real numbers, uh, the real numbers are actually higher in both cases. Um, we have four catalog requests per second. That doesn't sound like a lot, but remember we're only running Puppet twice a day. And uh, Puppet is definitely the sort of service where our internal tools have trouble counting that low. So it's four requests per second times four CPU seconds per request times a linear scaling factor of one, just to make the math easy, the real N is higher than that, is 16 CPUs. We tend to run Puppet on four vCPU virtual machines, so we would need four such machines, virtual machines, to handle our global average load using these uh, quote-unquote real numbers. That does not account for load spikes, it does not account for maintenance, it does not account for anything. So what if you want to run Puppet every five minutes? So every five minutes is 288 times a day, or 144 times more than we're already running it. And in this example, it's 576 requests per second, which works out to be over uh, 2,300 CPUs, or 576 of the virtual machines that we typically run Puppet on. And that already sounds like a lot, but it turns out that we forgot about Anycast. With Anycast, every one of your sites has to be able to handle a global load because your traffic may be directed there. So 11,520 CPUs or 2,880 virtual machines. So that is a, if I'm doing my math right, a two order of magnitude increase over the uh, 16 that we originally started with. So. That's a lot of machines. Uh, we could run that many machines for a service if we wanted to, but it would be really great if there was a population, if there were a fleet of machines that we could push the catalog compilation out onto that already existed. And it turns out that there are. We are moving to what we call a standalone puppet model. Standalone puppet is our term for puppet without puppet masters. So it turns out that if you provision your puppet manifest directly on the clients, they can do their own catalog compilation. They can run the ENC themselves. They can do everything themselves. You don't need a puppet master. The only problem you have to solve, and it sounds so simple, is you have to figure out a way to securely provision your manifests onto the nodes. Um, in Google's environment, the puppet masters turn out to be redundant. We realize that since we're running Ubuntu systems, we're always going to have to have the ability to provision Debian packages onto the system. So we now are moving to a model where we are packaging our modules up as Debian packages. It turns out that a Puppet module is just a directory of files, and creating a Debian package out of a directory of files is pretty trivial. Uh, we have uh, created some tools in our build system, unfortunately proprietary Google Magic, um, that make it easy for add-on module owners in particular to... Um, to easily create and manage Debian packages. We support auto builders, for example. And then we serve them from apt-compatible repo repositories. 
So under the hood, um, the packages are stored in tracked repositories. So you, um, you're, you, you're repos you'd have like an unstable repository testing stable, just like everything else. The difference with standalone Puppet is since you're not talking to a Puppet server that has something hard-coded in a configuration file, you can just pick whatever track of the add-on module you want to run. And therefore, you can, the add-on module track is decoupled from the, pup, from the core OS track, finally. Um, and it's under full control of the add-on module owners. You do not have to even run the same tracks that are provided by the core operating system. A lot of uh, teams like to stick a canary track in between testing and stable, or an old stable track after stable. Um, we collect all of the stable packages. We do require them to have a, a repository named stable. And we collect all the stable packages into a single repository, and we automatically provision that repository on our Ubuntu servers so that if you want to run a stable server, you don't have to do anything special in your add-on module manifests to make sure that the correct track of the package is installed. It's all already there. Um, our wrapper script has been changed to run the ENC. It runs the ENC to get the list of classes that are being added to the node, so it knows which packages that it has to install. It installs the packages that it needs so that the modules are installed. The modules unpack to a directory. It happens to be var lib standalone puppet. It could be anywhere. And then the wrapper script runs puppet. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with puppet, this is sort of the guts of the command that we use. You have to tell it where the modules are, and because you're doing a catalog compilation, you have to tell it where your main manifest is so it knows where to start compiling. Puppet will run ENC a second time automatically, and it will consume the data automatically as usual as though it were running on the Puppet Master. Literally, all you have to do, like our, our manifests run completely unchanged in standalone, function, in standalone fashion. The only difference is where the catalog is being compiled and where the modules live. And so uh, there are a number of benefits once we're uh, done rolling out. This is going to be pretty nice. Uh, catalog compilation is pushed out onto the nodes. So modulo our engineers screaming at us for tying up one of their CPU cores, we can run Puppet as often as we want. Uh, we have not yet started ramping it up, but I think we're going to soon. Uh, and as I mentioned, the add-on module track is finally untied from the core operating system track. And we can finally allow facts in add-on modules, traditional Puppet facts that would be served with plug-in sync if we were using Puppet Masters. And the reason it, for that is you cannot apply server types to servers that you don't own in the machine database. Therefore, you cannot get your add-on module to run on, run on somebody else's server without social engineering them to install it. So therefore, your add-on module facts only run on the servers that you own. And so you can do facts the normal Puppet way. Once this is up and running, it will be a lot simpler for us because for all of our nodes, we will have eliminated an entire service as a dependency. We no longer will depend on the Puppet service. We will depend, which as I said, turns out to be redundant. Uh, we will just depend on the services that we would need anyways if we were just running straight uh, Ubuntu systems, in particular our ability to deploy Debian packages. And it frees up resources for us because we'll be able to return the dozens of uh, virtual machines running Puppet. We're going to start doing this next quarter, and the resources can be used for other things. The major drawbacks really have been the setup cost. Um, the Ubuntu team went first. They're, I'm going to say about, I'm going to call it 90% done with standalone Puppet. Um, and it took them about a year to get to that point. It's been a lot of work. Uh, and unfortunately, other teams that want to go standalone puppet, they can piggyback on some of the work. But, you know, for example, Mac Ops, um, who are, I'd say about 85 or 90 percent along too, can't, couldn't use all their work because obviously Macs don't use Debian packages. So they had to come up with a different way to uh, provision their manifest. They're actually just using GPG signed tarball served by a different mechanism. And the other major drawback is that we've kind of mucked up release management a little bit. Um, Previously, our release management was done entirely in source control. You'd just go, okay, I'm going to do a merge. I'm going to merge this out ahead, and I'm going to merge this out ahead, but I don't want that, and I don't want that, and I don't want that. And it was really easy to cherry pick individual changes that you wanted to release. And if you wanted to roll a release back, just revert to the CL. With standalone Puppet, you get, in particular for add-on modules, you get 
you have to build the package with whatever is in op whatever is in source control at the time the package is built. You get all of the changes. And since we're using auto builders, it's really easy to get packages in the unstable track of your add-on module that have or get packages in the unstable track of your add-on module that have changes that you have not tested yet. And now that security update comes along that you need to push out right now. Well, it wouldn't be responsible of you to push out untested changes with your security change, so you have to build a new package with all of your untested changes reverted and the one security change that you want, and then you can push that out the tracks. And then you can go back and you can reintroduce your uh, untested changes and build a new package and test them out and do your thing. We've kind of compromised release management a little bit. Um, you can do things like manually build from, like you can use source control to integrate into your testing track, for example, and then manually build a package in your testing track and push it in, and push it into testing and skip unstable, and then just come along later with a higher version package. And that's basically what the core operating system teams get, do to get around this. That's not nearly as nice as just being able to do it entirely in source control. So these are sort of sort of the issues that we've had, by and large, standalone Puppet is going to be a big win for us. And that really is about all that I have. Thank you. All right, I'm going to be turning on these microphones if everyone who wants to ask questions can line up. Uh, don't, really, don't bother raising your hand, just come onto the lines. Let me, if you want to turn that one on or I'll be there in a moment. Hey, great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, I saw you speak at PublicConf a few years ago, and you were talking about catalog compilation caching uh, on the F5s. Did that not work out well? On the or did you I may have mentioned catalog compilation. Um, I think Puppet does support special servers where you can uh, offload the catalog compilation. You still need a fleet of servers to... We, ne we never actually tried it, and you would still need a fleet of servers to uh, compile the catalogs. But uh, caching them on the load balancers once they're compiled. Hmm. I don't remember saying anything about that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I did speak at PuppetConf a couple of years ago. No, we never tried anything like that. Yeah, I, um, I was wondering about the number of CPUs you need if you're going to run the job every five minutes. Wouldn't that, um, for example, depends on uh, how many tasks you have to perform? Um, then wouldn't it average down if you're running it every five minutes? Or do you need that constant the, number? The of catalog numbers? compilation time is the same in every case. So if you have a node and its catalog compiles in five seconds, the next time it, it puppets, no matter what the local set of local changes required are, it's probably still going to take about five seconds. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. You're out the <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? With standalone Puppet, are you, um, will you be able to use a certificate to sign the add-on modules and things like that so you're sure that whatever um, that's compiled will be what you release from? The, the add-on modules are signed with the release signing key at the app repository, not with Puppet certificate. So it's still signed, it's just signed with a different certificate. It's not, a, not exactly a question related to the very interesting thing you were describing at the end, but. Um, you mentioned at some point that you had some interesting rules in source control to try to ban people from doing bad stuff. With, you know, you, external facts in, in add-on modules was the example. Yep. Are there any others you can share? Because I think that's one of the things I've always seen as being very difficult in the sense that you, know, you give people a quite a lot of control over what they do in a box. How do you enforce that they do the right things and not the wrong things? So facts in add-on modules are one of the few examples that I can think of. In fact, maybe even the only example I can think of where we out and out block a puppet, um, excuse me, block a puppet feature. <coughs> excuse me. Um, we're not using... <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, I can't think of another example where we've done this. Um, most of the other... Okay, so when we were... Um, managing our puppet manifest through source control and doing it through merges, we would do things like block uh, edits to the testing and the stable branches. You had to integrate into those branches. You couldn't check in directly. But as far as blocking puppet features, I can't think of another example. Cool. Thanks. When you're in the stand, maybe you covered this already, but in the standalone puppet infrastructure, when you have the ENC, does that make some sort of network call, or is that some data pushed out with the manifest and everything else? 
In our particular case, it's, the data is cached locally. The uh, wrapper script uh, downloads the YAML mapping file and stores it locally. Uh, if we rewrite the uh, ENC as a service like I'm thinking about, then the ENC that runs on the masters and on the nodes will probably just end up being a network client of that service. I'm just wondering if you have any special techniques or methods that you use to keep catalog compilation times down. Have a smaller catalog. <laughs> yeah. Anything special to avoid? No, not that I know of, no. So you were talking about increasing the frequency of like Puppet applications. And my question was, if you're pushing the configuration to distribution via the standard like package channels, aren't you then sort of forcing your Puppet runs to only be updated as fast as the Puppet sh the package channels? And yep. isn't that slower yep. than, you know, five yep. minutes? It turns out that our uh, apt-compatible repositories, we're not using the uh, Debian tools here, we're using proprietary Google bits. Our apt-compatible repositories are fast enough to support that. Okay. And unfortunately, that's about all I can tell you. Uh, can you give any insight into how you approached uh, creating the ENC or anything? I, I'm, I'm sort of approaching that problem where I work now, so any, I mean, obviously your scale is probably living to mine, but... Do you have a, a particular issue that you're running into? I haven't even started it yet, so I just... Aha! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what did you write it, like, what did you write in? What were sort of the, the concerns you had to solve? Uh, well, it's written in, ours is written in Python, um, and... Uh, the, as I said, the ENC at Google for, performs a very specific task, a very specific Google-specific task of allowing us to take a node certificate name and map it to a fully qualified domain name. So that, that part right there is a the part that you'll probably need to be able to support something like that. You'll need, to find, you'll need to have a way of accessing your node's facts. You can do it the way we're doing it, by just reading the fact cache off a disk. There's a directory, uh, varlib puppet. YAML facts, I think. And in that directory, you'll find name by cert name, fact caches for all of your notes. They'll be YAML files. And you can read the facts out of there. Or you can do something like run PuppetDB or otherwise do something to share state between, um, between your Puppet backends. Beyond that, uh, the ENC is just a script. It does whatever business logic you need. Cool, man. I'm on AWS. I suppose the fact a host name is good enough to figure out Work in there. Yeah. Yeah, you, well, yeah, you need to figure out what your certificate names are going to be. Right. Um, if you have fully qualified domain names that you can use, I suggest doing that. Uh, using the UUIDs has caused us all kinds of troubles. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I've been using Puppet for years, uh, for about three or four years now, and I love it. But my concern is always if someone breaks into the Puppet server, they have the keys to the kingdom, right? Because yep. they have passwords, you know, SSH keys or SSL certificates if you choose to distribute them that way. Um, and that would be my concern with a standalone server is that now you have a lot of information on every machine. So do you it, not have any of that information in your particular configurations or are you not that concerned about it? It turns out that we do not provision most of our secrets like that using Puppet. Uh, we have company policy, for example, that you're not supposed to be checking password caches in to uh, source control. Uh, we do some of our own things to do that. Within my team uh, specifically, uh, things like private keys uh, are provisioned outside of Puppet. We have a bootstrap script that we run that uh, copies them from other servers. So we try not to provision secret data using Puppet for, and for exactly the reason that you described. But still, if somebody broke into my Puppet server, they still have the keys to the kingdom because they could change the manifest on disk to do whatever they wanted. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, one of the advantages with a configuration management system and, and having a central server is the ability to report back on the state of the system without having to actually have access to those systems, like last known state. Is that something you'll be losing by, by migrating to package-based distribution rather than a server-based uh, configuration convergence? Yeah, we're actually losing a little bit of that central reporting um, because we don't have a central puppet server to collect the reports. Um, I think, so we, we, we do have a central machine database, uh, as I mentioned, we have, we have a couple of machine databases, but we have a machine database that collects information about our Puppet nodes in the same way that the Puppet dashboard would. It's not, it's, it's proprietary Google bits, I can't talk about, but one of the things that we're stuffing in there is, is the Puppet reports. So um, we do not, or we do have the ability to centrally uh, to centrally query the state of our systems, but we're not doing it in an open source way, if, if that makes sense. 
Um, so I was just wondering how you logistically manage the uh, you know hundreds of hands touching the puppet repository. If it's uh, your team manages all the common modules, and if another team creates a module that other teams want to use, how if you can speak to any how that's uh, sort of managed and. So my team, the only modules that my team owns are the modules for the services that we deploy. And as, uh, not all of our, we don't even deploy all of our services using Puppet. So the only thing that my team does for add-on modules, for the, we're not involved at all in the uh, Puppet code for the core operating systems. They do their own thing. They own those directories and source control. They do their own thing. For the add-on modules, the only thing that we do is we inform, we, we perform some basic gatekeeper checks. We will make sure that their module is in the, their files are laid out in the autoloader format and that they have the minimum uh, required. So that means a, at minimum, a module with a manifest directory and an init.pp. And we make sure that the ownership of the directory and source control is set up so that that team owns it and not us. And that's all the, the involvement that my team has. We used to provide the service when we were, um, back in the day, we used to provide the service that we were, um, that we would audit for style an entire manifest or an entire module, and we don't do that anymore. It was too much work. Does that answer your question? Uh, I guess one, one small bit on that is, uh, if you, um, so your team doesn't handle it, but how do you, um, if there ends up being, a, say, a conflict between how one team's handling a module versus another team. Um, the only conflict that we would have like that where there's a conflict between modules between two, two different teams is a core operating system team's mo breaking something that an add-on module has done. And as a general rule, the core operating system team is going to win. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep. Anyone else? Yes. If you would. So this, um, with, with this distributed uh, puppet system, how are the nodes going to be aware of uh, changes? Uh, like if you change a manifest. How does a node know that it, when it needs to make a puppet run? Is that the yes. question? Yes. So that happens automatically. The node makes a pu our nodes make two puppet runs a day whether they need it or not. Okay, but how do they update their modules? Oh, 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 oh. So um, with traditional Puppet, with Puppet Masters, they don't, the, the modules are not shipped to the nodes. They're, uh, they're only on the Puppet Masters. Mm -hmm. if but in the distributed Puppet, are you going to do like a git uh, fetch or oh, for you're, you're, you're asking how we do it. We actually do a checkout. Uh, we don't run git, but we do a checkout from source control and do a temporary directory on the Puppet servers, and then we just rsync the uh, manifest into place. And by and large, that works okay. Uh, in the past, I've been asked if that causes me causes us trouble. Once in a great while, you'll get a puppet node that happens to have uh, done a plugin sync right at the same time that the plugin that rsync is updating the directory. And um, plugin sync will, plugin sync does what's called a recursive file transfer. It'll transfer everything, and it'll all and it may pick up the temporary files left by rsync. And when it actually comes to transfer those files, the transfer fails because it's an rsync temporary file. So once in a great while, I've seen this maybe four or five times, we get a puppet, we get a puppet run that breaks as a result of rsyncing uh, the manifest into place on the server. But it's not generally a problem. Thank you. Please, please go to the mic. Please, no, but, but please, this is. What is that number? One three zero one three. Uh, flip it over and put it on an 80s style calculator spells Bob in Church of the Subgenius. Okay. Can I ask one other question? Yeah. Um, if you're going to uh, run every five minutes, it seems like Puppet's, uh, Puppet's uh, resolution of the, of the, the manifest, is the right terminology, mm -hmm. is uh, somewhat intensive. So if you're talking about devices that are commonly uh, battery powered, is that a concern? And, or, or if oh, you yeah. measure that and it's not? Yeah, that would absolutely be. Um, a concern. My estimate is that if we actually ran Puppet every five minutes, we would be tying up the uh, one core of the node CPU something like 10 to 30 percent of the time, depending on the, uh, the, the uh, catalog compile time and how long the overall Puppet run uh, takes. 
Uh, some of our puppet runs take up to a minute, for example. So, uh, and use significant amounts of resources. So yes, on a laptop, that would be a major concern. And as I alluded to, uh, even our uh, desktop users, our workstation users, would be kind of annoyed by this because we're tying up one of their CPU cores. Even if we nice it out of existence, it doesn't matter. You're still tying up one of my CPU cores, stop it! We would have a very vocal uh, minority that would yell at us if we did that. All right, I'm, I'm gonna call in another questions then and we're gonna go on to the trivia stage. Uh, if you didn't know, I think I'd mentioned at the beginning, we're doing question and answer, and then we're doing trivia. So the, um, the reason we do trivia is to make sure you're all paying attention. Um, we have Jason, in this case, uh, pr take a number of things from his presentation, and if you're paying attention, he will ask you about them, and you will get to come up and choose either one of these actual books or one of these two ebook vouchers from O'Reilly, which you can reclaim. Uh, at their site for an e-book. So the rules are, uh, Jason will ask the question, I will try to look out and see everybody, and the first hand I see go up will get the first chance, second chance. Please don't shout out answers because you're, you're not going to get it, and that makes people very upset. Okay? All right. Go for it. So uh, start off with a couple actual trivia questions. Even if you weren't paying attention to my talk, you may still know the answer to this, these two. So what puppet version deprecates node inheritance and the global main manifest? I saw your hand first. 3.7? Yep. Come on up. You have, that was yes, right? Yep. So let me, oh, sorry, quickly. The books we have here are an eclectic mix. Uh, again, the two vouchers, the Scala cookbook from O'Reilly, Effective JavaScript, uh, Addison Wesley, Learning CF Engine 3, uh, this was a small O'Reilly book, and the DevOps Troubleshooting Cookbook. How did that get in here? <laughs> It seems, it, there seem to be copies of that everywhere. I will, I will go with the voucher. <laughs> All right. So. Okay. So what puppet version deprecates dynamic variable lookup? I saw you in the purple shirt. I'm sorry, I don't even remember the version. I moved it to 3.0. Hmm. Uh, you're right in front of him. I see you now. Yep. All right. Yeah, it still worked in 2.7. In it was just deprecated and print lot, printed lots of annoying spammy warnings. Yeah, lots of warnings on that one. All right, so now a Google-specific question. Uh, historically, what tracks did we support for Google's add-on puppet modules? No hands? No one. Someone? Any, it's free to guess. All right, I see your hand up. And? He's giving it to you. Go for it. Experimental. All right. That sounds like a no. Uh, over there. That's it. Whichever, take whichever one you prefer. All right. What puppet feature, uh, or what, rather, what software feature, finally allowed our add-on module owners to have custom facts in their modules? Uh, you over here? That's right. Yep. Someone who uses puppet, it seems. All right, which operation on a Puppet config server tends to dominate the CPU? Uh, I see you in front here in the orange jacket. Yep. This is great, everyone's doing really well today. So will it be CF Engine? Oh, I have that already. Oh, well. You have, no, the voucher is for any book from O'Reilly, so. All right, and so for the CF Engine book, other than the node cert name, how does the ENC require, or acquire the data that it needs to make its decision? This is at Google? Uh, no, this is in general. I, I saw your hand there going up. Yep. <laughs> CF Engine 3 for your needs. <laughs> 